Joining me now from Toronto is Murray Klippenstein, a prominent Toronto litigation lawyer. Now, Murray has joined a legal challenge mounted by the Canadian Constitution Foundation against the Law Society of Ontario. Welcome to BCN, Murray. Pleasure to be here. Now, some of our viewers may not be aware of the highly unusual requirement that the Law Society of Ontario is putting on its members. Can you explain? Sure, and um, in doing so, I'll uh, maybe give people an idea of why they should um, perhaps even listen to a, a lawyer, for starters, and a lawyer from Toronto, um, which is the, the, the events here at the Law Society level tend to um, uh, spread in different provinces and across the country because the Law Societies talk to each other and sometimes follow each other, and the, the, the Law Society in Ontario is the biggest in uh, in Canada with uh, more than 50,000 lawyers that they regulate. And it's actually one of the wow. biggest in the, in the common law world. Um, the Law Society makes rules for lawyers and they're legally binding, so they're law. And what the Law Society has done uh, fairly recently, a little over uh, a year and a half, is uh, pass a rule that every lawyer must uh, adopt and abide by a statement of principles that requires us to do something. And um, for me, uh, and actually a lot of other lawyers, to have somebody, especially the government, say, you have to adopt this statement of principles, we're going to tell you which are your principles, really flabbergasted me when I first read it, and still flabbergasted me. Um, so one issue is they're telling me what I'm supposed to publicly say are my principles. Which my principles are mine, I always thought, and I still believe. Uh, and then they fill in the, the principles, and at first glance, what principles are sound very nice. It's supposed to be, we promote diversity and inclusion. And at first glance, those sound very good. Um, but um, I, can, I can say more about that. But that's the basic um, issue here, which is the Law Society, I think, is basically telling me what I have to think, what I have to say, what I have to believe. You know, this reminds me a lot of the attestation that the Liberal government put on its summer jobs grant program, that you have to agree with abortion, and if not, then you're not going to get the funding. So that ain't right, Murray. Well, that's, that's uh, I see your analogy. This is even worse in my assessment because it's telling me that these are my principles. I have to state them. I have to publicly state them. And so it's forcing words in my mouth. Now, you say this has become politicized, a form of identity politics, ordering the legal profession to obey a set of these specific political ideologies. Is this really a condition of the license? Yes, um, because the law society has the, has the force of law. It uh, tells us lawyers whether or not we get our license and whether or not we can practice. And so they made this requirement, the compulsory statement of principles, um, obligatory. They said they're going to enforce it. There will be compliance measures or punishment. And um, so um, it's, uh, yeah, my career is at stake and, and of 50,000 lawyers. If we don't comply, the Law Society has been pretty vague and a little bit uh, sneaky about how they're going to enforce it and when, um, but uh, they said they will. And uh, so when I first saw this, I spent a year, frankly, agonizing about it because um, what am I going to do? I have a fork in the road. Either I obey or I don't. And if I don't, they're going to punish me. And eventually down the road, that means I will have to be disbarred by them unless something changes. So what's the biggest issue you're taking with the ideology? Tell me a bit about that. Well, um, as I said, I'm supposed to now um, uh, promote diversity and inclusion. And uh, I used to think those were a good sounding words that I wouldn't want to or do disagree with. But um, when you actually look at what um, people who, who, who propose and push for that say and do, which I spent about a year researching, I was, I was stunned because it seems to be that the word diversity, for example, is a bit of a mask and a bit of a, uh, it hides a lot of things that uh, come with it. Um, and to pick one example, um, what the Law Society's report on this issue said is that one of their objectives, and that's their word, is for racialized, that's a, that's a funny word, comes out of sociology and very political, um, racialized members of the profession should uh, now uh, be represented 
to the same degree they are in the population, in all workplaces, at all levels of seniority, in the same proportion. So when you actually look at that in detail, what that means is that um, in all workplaces in the profession, the objective is to basically have uh, people uh, hired and then promoted uh, based on their skin color. Now, is this requirement unconstitutional, Murray? Don't Canadians have the charter right to believe as they choose and to speak as they choose? Uh, I think so. I thought so, and that's what I intend to do. Uh, but um, by making this something I have to um, sign on to as a statement of principles, um, I, you know, don't have, I think, the right to to express myself or to think about these issues. I think thinking about issues is very important. I mean, look at it from different points of view. People may say, you know, thinking about things, I've got too much in my life. I got to put food on the table. I, I got to, I'm not doing well at my job. So what's this about freedom of expression? It doesn't matter, but I, I think it does matter for all of us, to, you know, for us to think about what we believe in, to express it or not. So I, I think it's, I think it's very important. And, and um, you know, for my, when I look down the road on this, I said, um, I, I spent 20 years building a, a law firm that in, in, to a large degree was focused on access to justice and helping the disadvantaged. I said, I can't even, do that anymore. I can't operate my firm for the next 10 years the way I thought I would, the way I planned. It was my vision because I'm going to be in conflict with the law society. That will harm my reputation with the clients, with other lawyers. People in the firm are going to, you know, either disagree with me or don't want to be associated with it. And I'm going to be implementing someone else's political ideology in my law firm. And I don't want to do it. I think that's wrong. And I just, I won't do it. So on the equality side of this requirement, are law firms going to be mandated to have a certain percentage of racial and gender representation on their staff list? Um, basically, yes. Um, this all started out with a focus on, on helping racialized members of the profession, which I think is a great thing. Uh, and then it became very ide ideological. And then um, the Law Society, with a, in a few minutes at a meeting, without thinking about it, added on... Um, that this would apply to all equality-seeking groups. Um, and again, from where I come from, I was always a strong, and I still am a strong supporter of, of the idea of equality. Um, but now there's this list, they didn't give us the list, but all other equality-seeking groups that the same thing applies to. So, it, you know, you basically have in the profession all these compartments and boxes of basically quotas based on Frankly, sorry, the skin color you were born with, the sex chromosomes you were born with, or, you know, you mentioned identity politics, any kind of uh, sort of identity that you believe in that you can't, that can't be questioned. Um, and so um, I don't think that's good for the profession or for the public, for anybody. And, uh, you know, so that's just dealing with the ideology sort of, which is separate from the idea of me being forced to say as a matter of principle that I support this. So what has the response been like from other lawyers in the trenches? Are they good with the requirement or do they have serious issue with it as well? Well, for a long time, there was silence because this is the law society with basically legal brute force saying we're going to force you to do this. And most lawyers, like most other people, are very busy and hectic with their day-to-day -day lives and putting, as I said, food on the table and taking the kids to hockey and stuff. So most people, there was no talk about it. And the law society, I think they, this was a very cunning, I think. They made it so easy to comply and so hard to stand up against it. So all you have to do is check a box uh, on the annual filing uh, report, literally click, one click with the mouse, say, I comply, and then you're home free. And even though I think thousands of lawyers don't like this idea, very few speak up. And the, the Law Society has publicly said that something like 95% of lawyers have clicked the box. And um, in a way, that's that's scary. In a way, it's understandable. Who's going to, you know, take a stand of principle on this with the cost of your career? And certainly for, you know, a year, I said, Murray, you're nuts if you think you're going to resist this because you will you lose your career, you'll lose your reputation, um, and you'll lose the vision you had for your firm. <clears throat> And uh, why do it? You're, you'd be insane to, but something in, I hate to sound all sort of, you know, almost pompous about it, but something in my soul said, if you do this, you can't live with yourself. So I basically made a plan to wind down the law firm I'd spent 20 years building. Um, and uh, so I can take a stand. 
man has to be able to sleep well at night. Is the Law Society going to enforce this requirement? Are they going to disbar members if they don't comply? Well, excuse me, that's a funny thing. They said they would force compliance. Um, I think that the, uh, there's been uh, now an increasing pushback from, from prominent lawyers, from, from many, many hundreds of lawyers. Um, I don't know if they have the guts or, I'm going to say, the integrity to enforce it. Um, and uh, they're base it's a fiasco now. Um, and there are still lots of lawyers who, um, frankly, and this puzzles me, maybe it's younger lawyers or, or diversity ideologues, they don't seem to really care about freedom of expression, freedom, freedom of thought. Um, and so, um, you know, what they're going to do is unclear. But um, by putting us in that position, basically by putting, I hate to say it, but a legal gun to our head, um, you know, any lawyer, any person would say, uh, well, why would I not comply? The cost of not complying is so high, and the cost of complying is just one click on the mouse. Um, so uh, there are some some really increasingly brave lawyers. There's now actually something like 20 or 22 lawyers who all of us together are running in the next venture election um, on a matter of principle. But uh, voter turnout in the law society elections is relatively low because most people just say, let the law society do their thing and they're busy. So I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, increasingly people are speaking up. And again, going back to where I started, um, I think that, um, that something like this will probably happen um, in the legal profession in, in Alberta. It's happening everywhere and in schools, in government, in media, um, in political parties. Um, you know, if you, if you say, wait a minute, I'm not prepared to just wholeheartedly say I support this thing called diversity, I think we should think about it. Of course, you're immediately branded a racist, a sexist, um, and so forth. And that's starting to happen with me from people who I think should know better. But that's a part of the price you're paying. So, Murray, could the Law Society's ideology have a major impact on certain types of lawyers? For example, if a lawyer fights for the right of a faith-based private school to not have a gay straight alliance in their schools, is it possible these kinds of lawyers will simply lose their licenses? <laughs> Well, I don't think it's come to that in Alberta yet. Um, I think that uh, logically that's probably where it could end up uh, in Ontario right now. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think the law society would have the guts, if I can use that word, to push it that far. But all it takes is somebody to file a complaint against uh, a lawyer um, saying they're not respecting diversity. Um, and then that process would grind it through. I mean, I don't think realistically it would happen. It would be a bit of an uproar, I would hope. But um, again, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a fork in the road, and that's probably where one, one, one of those roads goes. And it's very intimidating and very scary. And going back to the star, I mean, I don't think that we should be in this situation at all. I mean, with, with freedom to think and freedom to, to express yourself, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief. Um, you know, this this is the wrong way to deal with, you know, if, 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 there, there are some issues, but this is the wrong way to deal with it. Let's go back to what you were discussing earlier about how you and some of the lawyers are mounting an election campaign to become directors on the Law Society board in order to change things from the inside. When will this case actually go to court? Well, uh, you mentioned, and there's two things. One is the election, which happens in April. Uh, and then I'm also uh, letting my name stand in a legal challenge. Uh, now, the, the legal process is very slow, as, as, as you know, uh, as folks know. So it could take, could take years for that to be resolved. And, and it, you know, there's usually a, a first level decision, then an appeal, perhaps another appeal. So it could take a long time. And one of the things about the, the legal process is that um, <clears throat> the, the courts generally have a rule that when a, a, a body like the Law Society or some other body that has legal authority to make decisions uh, and is supposedly expert on, and the courts will take a bit of a hands-off position, and they don't want to interfere. So, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a slam dunk. Um, and uh, you know, so it could be, could be years. I mean, in the election coming up in April, uh, as I say, there's a, a, a fair bit of a apathy in the, in the, in the legal profession. And although I'm getting huge number of calls and emails from people who. Are, are silent about this and intimidated by, uh, by, the, by the pressure, but who are very concerned and supportive. It seems obvious that freedom of thought and speech is being violated here, but is any of this a guarantee of a legal victory for you? 
Um, no, uh, I, I wish I could say it's 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 clear and obvious, but but it isn't. And um, um, so uh, I, you know, I'm I'm grateful for. Um, you mentioned the Canadian Constitution Foundation stepping in and, and supporting me in this, and, and my co-applicant, uh, Professor Ryan Alford, uh, and I have a, a good team leader and lawyers here, uh, Asher Honickman. Um, I mean, um, two years ago when I took this stand, among other things, I thought that if I if I took this stand, the law society would grind me down eventually to spar me, and I I wouldn't be able to defend myself because I. I Frankly, I can't afford a lawyer, uh, not not at these costs. And the law society would spend a million dollars on a lawyer. And because of the political pressure, um, you know, I, there's very few senior lawyers who would be willing to take a stand and and uh, you know and defend defend this. I, I I would hope so, but there's tremendous political pressure. As I say, if you had express any doubt about this magical term called diversity, then then people accuse you of racism, sexism, and 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 whatnot. Should be interesting to see how this plays out. Murray Klippenstein, Toronto litigation lawyer, thanks a lot for joining me today on BCN. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.